Hi everyone. Um, my name is Ivan Svetunkov. I'm lecturer of marketing analytics at the Lancaster University and a member of Center for Marketing Analytics and Forecasting. And I, I've organized uh, these Friday forecasting talks. And, uh, we as a center, we've been trying to uh, make the agenda about reducing the gap between research and practice and that's the idea of uh, these talks that you are attending. This talk today uh, is the second in the series. We will have overall six of them. Um, today we are talking about forecasting software. It is based on the survey that the center has done uh, this summer for INFORMS. And the presenter today is Oliver Scheer. So everybody welcome and let's give Oliver a uh, word. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you very much for this introduction and thank you to the Center for um, uh, giving me the opportunity to present uh, our work. I should very much point out that this is a um, uh, collaborative work with Robert, Ivan and Alisa, so I'm not entirely sure why they choose me to present this. It's probably just they want to, me to enjoy uh, the entire Friday as much as possible with an early uh, wake up call here in the US. So uh, uh, nice welcome here as well. Or maybe they missed uh, my uh, strange uh, accent. And in case the accent should be an issue and something should not be clear, I can, uh, I'm happy to let you know, oops, that um, the foundation of this talk is, is this article that is uh, available for free on the RMS uh, Today website. It has also been published in the printed version. So in any case, uh, all details and uh, more or less what we will be going through to this presentation is, is also available in, in, this, uh, in this article. And I'm very much welcome you to have a look at it. And uh, also, I think uh, if you have any feedback, we would highly welcome uh, any 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 feedback, not just to this talk, but also for the next survey that is coming up. So if you are from the software um, industry or you are a user and you feel that uh, we are missing um, important issues, please point them out to us so we can keep improving. And a bit background on this RMS Today survey, it's that uh, it's quite uh, a long a long-standing biannual survey, so every two years. Um, to be fair, I'm only aware of the last uh, three editions. That's already six years, but uh, I'm pretty sure it has been published uh, uh, a lot more years in advance. And uh, so our group at uh, Lancaster has, um, has um, done this for the last two years. And uh, I think the nice bit or the idea generally behind this um, survey is to give actually the software vendors a chance to present themselves to the or uh, MS community, and I uh, should point out it's it's free, so it's it's uh, maybe I'm not sure, but maybe something that hasn't been spotted or you know um, assessed by the you know the aim hasn't come through that perfectly all the times so what exactly we are looking for when the survey questions go out, but uh, I I do think it's it's a very nice opportunity to sort of like um, provide the overview of what is out there. And because the, it's it's uh, um, there's a, a large amount of software uh, vendors and solutions um, on the market and which we will see later on. And uh, the idea is really to get a sort of like sense what product functionality is there and also assess them a bit from like an academic perspective um, what we would expect sort of like in this software to be and um, you know, sort of like it's it's always also interesting for us to sort of see um, what the developments are in the market um, obviously we always think that we would like to be leading but it's uh, often maybe also the the case that we are um, learning more from the market than uh, uh, than uh, than the other way around. So this this is uh, also for us a very nice exercise to get actually feedback, um, and it's actually a feedback loop. So basically, the the developments in the market are presented from the from the perspective of the software vendor. So they get input from the client. So it and they maybe be influenced from um, you know publications and or other talks that are available. 
so it's it's quite an interesting way of exploring um, how the how everything is 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 shaping. Um, and one thing I should point out, I think it's quite important, and uh, also in terms of like you know for the software vendors, what they ex can expect is that it's impossible to you know to basically assess the products uh, in in a, in a in a live setting. Since the, the number is so big, um, just going through all the software in like in trial outs and so on and run experiments and to really identify which one is the best uh, software out there, it's, 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 not, uh, it's, it's, it's not feasible at all. So uh, it's very important to say that, you know, this is not sort of a, we're not handing out trophies and diplomas for the best uh, software out there. It's not about bashing any of the, um, any of the uh, you know uh, vendors it's 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 an, also not a ranking it's just the overview on on in, and like sort of like a, 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 you know current state of the of the of the software industry um in this year we have um, had a major redesign we had a bit more time um to prepare our our uh, survey and uh, we were very grateful to uh, uh, receive a lot of valuable feedback from vendors and also from uh, people that read the article and uh, we tried to um, uh, incorporate that as much as possible. So there has been quite a lot of changes and uh, we uh, hope that uh, this year's edition is, uh, it can be noted. And uh, what it covers essentially is, uh, you know, a bit of um, uh, we look into you know, basic features like, you know, data handling, connectivity, of course, the forecasting features, but then I think also very important is that uh, things that are around the software, like the support, the licensing, and uh, as I said, recent changes. And here we actually ask for um, like what has been like included in the software over the last two years, or so doesn't have to be like two years, but major updates in the software recent. So we get a bit of a feeling of what has been added to the software. Um, that also obviously reflects a bit what the future trends will be, but we also ask us on top of that. So, how do they feel? Uh, see the field evolving, evolving over that over the uh, in the next couple of years. Um, in total, we have actually um, contacted about uh, more than 200 forecasting vendors, and now this is a very high number and just shows you how how many different solutions are actually out there. And I'm pretty sure this is not the uh, complete list, although we went far over the first uh, page on Google. Um, I think there are still m many more somewhere um, out there which we couldn't uh, get. So um, I think one of probably one. Uh, yeah, I think maybe one of the items that are really valuable for practitioners are looking for a new software is that this list is available online. So even if the uh, some software vendors did not reply, we it's still the contact details can be found. And I think it's it's, it's it can be a helpful source just to get an overview of um, what is really um, uh, out there. And um, what we re received as a response is obviously much lower than than this 200. Um, so we, we end at the moment as it stands, there are like 32 forecasting products. And um, first, should maybe mention if, in case your software version is not listed here, there is still time to actually add it to the online um, version. Um, yeah, we're happy to do that. Obviously, the print is already uh, gone, but uh, the online version can be still updated, or at least we can notify you next time when it comes alive. So just uh, um, drop us an email. And um, from the vendor solutions uh, we, we received, I think 45% uh, roughly represented themselves as um, as general purpose forecasting software. This just means that it can be used for a, l a large variety of forecasting problems. Um, but we also tried, and especially this year, we expanded this uh, to is to uh, look into like more specialized software like that uh, really focused on inventory management, for instance, or energy forecasting, as these are slightly different tools. So we tried also to, um, um, uh, pay, um, you know, look, uh, allow those um, um, software solutions to be um, he represented in the in the survey. Um, that brings me actually to our first sort of like section, I would say, from this talk about the uh, current state of forecasting software, as I as I as I called it. And um, I think we should maybe start with changes and how the software are distributed and built. And I think one important uh, bit here is to mention, and that also lies nicely links to this. Uh, um, 
previous um, text I mentioned on the, that we have perp uh, general purpose uh, software is that um, the way software is distributed in these days is becoming more and more modular in a sense that uh, it's very custom tailored basically and and what the uh, what the customer in the end how the software looks at at their end um it basically maybe it's it's, it's a basic setting but then it can be added very um uh, various functionalities and I think this is a large advantage than it is compared to the past where probably you had to wait for a new release to come up and you maybe remember in some software you probably had a function that nobody knew what it is doing but it was certainly built for someone that it is very valuable and it's just now in the software and everyone else sees it as well and I think this is something that will disappear more and more because now we have this cost uh, this modular design where basically for company x we can just build something if they have a really specific need it can just be programmed and it also shortens obviously the time that people have to wait for a new release version I think it makes everything more flexible both on programming end but also on the customer end and in, in a sense, the general purpose is becoming more specialized. You know, if you start with a general purpose, but then get a very specialized tool on energy forecasting, for instance, you know, it's it's probably melting there uh, uh, to to a certain extent. And uh, another thing we have seen is that there's substantial increase in 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 you know packages being uh, the software is being available as a software as a service, and uh, that has various reasons. Um, obviously, it's one is that it, it's um, it has uh, well, it's much easier to maintain on both ends. Um, maybe on the software developing end, I believe that you know having everything on a current version is so much more pleasant than having 20 versions that has to be still supported back because one client doesn't want to upgrade. So moving people to the cloud uh, software as a service uh, has just more. Um, it's easier to keep people on the same level of um, um, how the software uh, develops. And I think on the end of the user, it's obviously nice that a lot of uh, things that otherwise has, you know, are crucial in order to get the software running are now in the, like, you know, um, not anymore in the within the company um, responsibility so it, it sort of like uh, facilitates the IT um, infrastructure the other thing is obviously that its ability to scale and probably is one of the biggest push why we see this as too is that all with all this new big data machine learning um, it's just a question of whether you want to invest on your own data center um, that has to be upgraded continuously uh, or you know, go for a maybe ch cheaper option that, you know, you are with other people sharing infrastructure and just use it as much as you need it at that specific moment. Obviously, I think it should be important to mention also that the downside is that there is a dependency, obviously, from the service provider. So it's probably not the right place to save money. Um, if, you know, the cloud service is just shutting down, if it goes bankrupt, it kind of has a major impact on on obviously on, on, on the user end and uh, especially forecasting software, it's, it's probably you don't want to have to happen that there. And I think here also service level agreements becoming really vital to be, uh, you know, be checked very carefully. So, you know, how much uptime do you have and how, you know, all these kind of security standards and so on that uh, are uh, included into this. This is very important to to go through that uh, very carefully but uh, we will talk about this a bit more later um, and the other thing is that this database uh, you know, all we see generally is that the database connectivity nowadays is, is extremely high it's whether it is a local data warehouse or any of the big data frameworks like spark hadoop or cloud data centers it's it's basically very easy to to um, connect with with all the options what we also see is that um, it we have more support for open data formats uh, so that that is a very nice uh, nice thing as well and uh, also a large amount of software solutions we looked uh, you know we got responses from is that they integrate directly with ERP or other uh, software that can be used through APIs the programming interfaces so this has really make software be able to talk to each other. And I think this is a very nice development in general in the field that 
and probably for an end user as well. It's not like the C law software anymore that you have to copy out things and then copy it in the other one. They, they now really seamlessly interact with each other and uh, becomes way more um, pleasant to use them. And uh, I think also the productivity increases a lot. So that's something uh, very positive happening there. And maybe focus that updates outside the forecasting algorithms, which we we'll just touch on in the next uh, slides is I think uh, one uh, item that we believe is becoming more and more of cu crucial is collaborative features, um, which some companies already implemented. Um, we now use Teams, for instance. It's easy to share the same document, edit at the same time. Um, it's not anymore like one person locks the file for the next two hours. This can be all done now simultaneously. And I think that's also a yeah, sign of the time, especially when we all work like home offices and so on, that you know, these collaborative features becoming increasingly important. Keep comments and discussions inside the, the environment. And also there were quite a lot of companies actually mentioned that they uh, updated the user interface um, also on, in terms of like code editors or the, the, the way data is visualized. So there has been quite a lot of updates in, in this area. Um, and another thing that um, I think has has been quite clear in these surveys that uh, so this software has become uh, multilingual. They're not talking anymore their own language, but they're also now able to talk foreign languages, uh, especially programming languages that are able to integrate other um, um, other software code. Here, for instance, uh, especially thinking about the open source and uh, Python and R, um, it gives uh, a very large access to to algorithms. Um, that may be not part of the out of the box solution. Now, maybe if it comes to R and Python, I should maybe especially on R and I'm, I think it should be made clear that I think in my opinion R is 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 very much for is excellent for a, a sandboxing. And I think for many companies, if they have a new problem and they they want to you know go deeper in in and try out the newest algorithm, I think then. The, this R integration is, is fantastic, but it's maybe not the way of uh, running your software day to day basis in like a large for like where it has to scale. And whereas R is just not designed probably for it. And it might also be that many, many, uh, you know, uh, some R packages, the maintainer is just doesn't have this functionality that you would need. And I think then it's important to go back to the to the software developer and um, try to push them to include this into the you know, um, out of box solution functionality so that, that uh, you know, this is important that this can be added. So what out of the box comes usually is it's, uh, we have in all software solutions and hopefully that's something you would like expect is that standard linear time series methods um, like a REMA or exponential smoothing and also multiple linear regression. So that is actually all really well um, covered. And uh, also two thirds of the products, and we are happy to see that, you know, they have ad, ad hoc judgmental adjustments, something probably you're all aware, but it's really important, especially during those times, um, to be able to, to do adjustments uh, because it can add a lot of uh, value if done correctly. And uh, yeah, it's, it's really a feature that, that should every software um, should have. And Another thing is depending on the field, but for instance, we also seen that the new product forecasting is supported by a large amount of solutions. So this is something um, also important if you're more in the retail sector or you know any any type of um, manufacturing with a lot of new products coming to the market. Another thing that many, many vendors who came back with us and with also detailed comments is the increase. And we've seen that also in the numbers of uh, um, uh, methods implemented is that uh, machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence algorithms really um, are increasing a lot being able uh, enabled out of the box. Especially we see that the neural networks now almost 40% of the solutions have have a neural network can be of different types. Interesting enough we find that uh, for instance the LSTM which I think in our view is one of the most um, suitable for a time series is not the most uh, a represented one, but uh, and also the gradient boosting, for instance, I think we will probably see in the next couple of months a much more implementation since maybe you are aware that there are like, you know, the forecasting competitions 
and been heavily um, popularized the algorithm in, in that area. So, uh, so yeah, this this um, machine learning algorithms are really um, uh, becoming more and more available in in all of the the products. So, well, if everything is fine or or you know is is nothing missing. Um, of course, uh, it's the, we always find something, and it's not about um, it's 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 not um, it's not about you know making anything bad, but it's just uh, this is a very much on the the forecast evaluation is very much on the core of forecasting principles, and it's it's for us always a bit surprising how how much you know it, it's still um, missing on that end in a sense that. For instance, that we have like cross validation rolling evaluation, like it's uh, like one third of those solutions are not there. And uh, very basic models like random walk, only half of the solutions include them, although it's most probably the most trivial model to implement and gives you a very, very nice way of uh, just in getting an initial feel of how well are you performing um, with your uh, selected uh, forecast algorithm. And the other thing is that we noted is that you know the track of statistical forecast and export corrections. There's basically not everywhere history saved, and this is a big issue, especially if you want to improve on your forecast. I mean, any type of probably forecast expert that comes to your company and would like to see, um, you know, high help to improve. It is very vital to see sort of like what happened in the past. When do what what does the statistical forecast looked like? What were the expert corrections? Where was value added? Where was probably um, forecast weight made worse? In which situations? So having this information in there is really vital to um, you know to 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 critically assess um, how the entire forecasting process is working on uh, at the moment. So I think that that's something that you know should be should be um, yeah should be more present. In terms of the algorithms, I think um, that most of them are there. It's only, for instance, uh, uh, lasso and uh, regularization techniques. We have seen that not many solutions have actually support. Um, I should also point out that it might be available through an R implementation or from Python, but out of the box. It seems that this is not not so common, and it's surprising in a sense that because we all have this, um, you know, increase in you know using explanatory variables and so on, and uh, but we still have probably the lack of data history. Uh, the the time the product is on the market doesn't get longer, um, so but we have a large amount of variables to estimate. So our numbers of observations remain more or less the same maybe but we uh, we would like to fit the model and lasso is one of a way to um, to out for automatic variable selection that that can handle with large amount of uh, variables in on limited observations and another issue we we discovered is that in this inventory management software areas that uh, for intermittent demand there are certain distributions better suited than the normal distribution which uh, yeah, it's it's something that could be could be uh, helpful there. Um, and the last point here is uh, just uh, it seems, but I have um, yeah, it we should really point out that it's probably also a less less of a less of a concern. Is that time series visualization, specialized time series visualization like scatter plots and so on, it's not everywhere available. And uh, but I believe what's happening now is that uh, people use specific tools for um, like Tableau and so on to to create those uh, those plots and uh, can actually be exported even sometimes directly from the software and data can be exported to this this um, um, external uh, um, software that are specialized on that. So, um, but it might be just something that you know if you want to understand more about how you know your forecast model works how they perform visualization is a very helpful tool and i think it shouldn't be underestimated in the importance it has um so overall i think we can conclude a bit that this you know it's becoming more and more um because of this you know integration of open source software um probably the selling points of soft forecasting software in terms of algorithms is, is shrinking. And what are the other points that makes a software um, different? 
and I think it goes more into the IT sector, uh, like classic IT decisions, like, um, for instance, the, the regulations that are out there, um, how are they supported? Um, not all software, for instance, uh, help on the data protection law side. And uh, also, if you go to the uh, cloud, we, we only receive very few, uh, like not all um, solutions responded on how these uh, the quality standards are assessed you know like you have certain specific certificates for uptime for instance that follow a certain structure uh, the same on IT security uh, assessment and accessibility standards so these are very important questions there but um, uh, yeah it, it's something probably that um, um, is is very it makes a big difference in in maybe not initially but uh, it can have, uh, you know, some some negative effects in the future if suddenly, you know, GDPR is coming and you have to manually adopt, uh, adjust all your data and so on. So, you know, there might be some surprises out there which could be avoided by choosing um, wisely. And another uh, big point, I think, is training and support, although most uh, uh, you know, most of the solutions offer basic support. Free support is very limited. And maybe also another issue uh, point to point out is that um, that uh, some software also have extremely good in-house forecasting experts. That um, it's yeah, it's not just the software, but it's also the thing uh, you get with it. You know, it's 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 um, it's much more valuable in uh, more value in there than maybe in the forecast function itself. Um, and it, the service level agreement that is uh, that is comes with the support it's it's very crucial to to look into and basically service level agreement in many cases can be actually up to forecast as a service so you don't even have to do run your own forecast uh, somebody uh, at that company is, is basically taking care of that um, whether this is something you would like to opt for or not is a different question, but I think it's 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 an interesting development to see that, you know, we 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 are actually also not just uh, service like platform wise, but we also outsource uh, the the service itself. Or, uh, so that becoming a more of a of a of a of a trend. So just to sum up very quickly, how we do time wise, and probably have to speed up a bit. Um, this uh, well, we have traditional uh, unique selling proposition because more flexible software design, increased in data connectivity, and the software integration. Um, it also integrates with uh, much more with open source software, and in therefore the I think the weight or importance increases on traditional IT factors like service level agreement, as I just said, security, and price is probably still one of the major uh, points. And soft factors, as we just seen, technical support, and something we couldn't really assess in the survey, but I think the look and feel, how a software behaves, how you feel about it, how does it, um, the ease of working in it, I think has a major impact. But it's very hard to sort of like quantify that and how, without looking at the software in depth, how this how this really um, impacts. So what's basically the future? Um, of forecasting software, or you know, what has the how, how the vendors pointed out to us? Um, I think initial one point to uh, to mention here is the role of the customer in the software development. Um, it's it basically, I think, often algorithms only get implemented if there is if there is demand, if somebody is interested in having it. Otherwise, you know, there's no incentive for a company just to include algorithms for uh, for the sake of having it. Um, and I think here main drivers are, for instance, this competition and maybe have, I'm not sure how much you follow the M5 competition in Kaggle that uh, I think will now really push on the light GBM side that has been the winning, one of the winning algorithms. And uh, also I think open source packages can popularize uh, those kind of new algorithms if it if it's uh, if they are available and you know people um, start using them um, 
But we also hear from some vendors that, you know, even the feature is there, people do not really adopt it. And for instance, one of those that has been mentioned to us is prediction intervals. Although it's available in many, many um, soft, uh, solutions, it's it's apparently not so often used. And it's funny because we also see that a bit in this uh, M5 competition where, for instance, the prediction interval uh, stream has had way less um, submissions. So it's maybe a way of, you know, seeing the benefit in this um, and having prediction intervals that is um, missing. Uh, so it's, it's a very interesting uh, observation or a comment we, we received. And uh, last but not least, I think also, you know, having more industry collaborations uh, with academia would certainly help to um, also make open source packages that later can get integrated um, uh, more focused on at the end, uh, you know, on practice. Um, so we don't just develop an algorithm because we need publication, but also we develop an algorithm that is really helpful and addresses the issues that people observe in, in reality. And here I should probably point out a bit of uh, advertising. Uh, if you have any of type of, you know, interesting forecasting problem, get in touch with the CMAF uh, folks. And uh, what are the trends that impact software market? I think one item clearly that is still running there is big data. We have increase in uh, volume and velocity, and that will lead to, or well, basically it requires more automation. And uh, also because we have more data, it allows more complex model. Um, we can use uh, interaction, product interactions, for instance. We can try to search for a massive data set for leading indicators and so on. So I think this, this enables uh, a lot um, a lot, but also requires a lot more on the machine learning side and uh, ability to scale the entire process. And then we had uh, COVID um, or still having COVID. And here is obviously we, I mean, it's probably one of the, uh, um, well, one of the, for the next couple of years, we all have one of these COVID spikes in the data. Uh, if we train models, um, and especially in that certain moment, the ability of judgmental interventions just been extremely important. And I think what will happen as well is that maybe software becomes has more automated anomaly detection uh, to be included. So if something really runs out of 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 um, you know of of uh, of normal behaviors, then it should be stopped. You shouldn't forecast something that makes uh, no sense because the model just can't pick them up. Um, and I think that that will become more of a deal. And also we have um, the machine learning bit, of course. Uh, I think here um, M5 and other cargo competitions really uh, uh, will shape uh, the, the way, uh, you know, how these uh, algorithms are sort of like tested and then later on also uh, made their uh, way in, into practice. And what we also received as a comment is that uh, there is an increase, and probably because the data is available, increase in the incorporating and finding leading indicators. And um, maybe here as a, a small reading um, suggestion, uh, I can suggest to from the group, uh, Sagert et uh, al. 2018, and uh, uh, paper by myself. <laughs> that is, uh, I think, it will be our good starting point. The um, first one is on on economic, including economic leading indicators, and the second one assesses the uh, the use of Google Google Trends and online use generated content, essentially. So I, I think uh, that, that could be a helpful uh, read. Um, so to conclude, a bit with uh, advice on what how to choose the right forecasting software. Um, I think it's very important to first determine, think about the forecasting needs. What is really the must have there? Um, what type of time series do you have? Or do you have a, observe a lot of demand, intermittent demand? Maybe you're in the fashion industry, then new products will be one of the major concerns or you want to find that leading indicator. So that really drives a bit in which area you should maybe start um, selecting your software. And then how often you need to do this uh, forecast and the volume of it, you know, that really uh, in, in has a big impact on how capable the algorithms uh, have to be. So this is only like a one time a month, 10 time series, or is it hundreds, millions of forecasts every day? And also what is available in house? So do you have experts? Do you have data scientists that are, you know, able to develop even own algorithms? 
or is there a lot of like training needs? So this really uh, affects what type of software is best suited in a sense. And uh, you know, uh, integration with data warehouse, ERP, and specific security requirements that are uh, that in your field are required. And then also in the end, do you want to host it at your own site or do you want to go for a software as a service solution? I think these are important steps. And uh, lastly, well, in our view, maybe it's helpful. It's not about being patriotic, but uh, helpful to have a vendor that is nearby. I think can be can be a can be a good point because it's it's uh, it can be difficult to, especially in the initial phase or when you have support. Although it's often stated to be twenty four seven, but. Uh, if your vendor is nearby and you can visit their their headquarters or vice versa, they, they can send someone over. It really helps, although now in times of COVID, obviously this all has been a bit remote, but overall I think it's it, it shouldn't be underestimated. And uh, the last advice is really if you before buying, really test the software. I mean, there are most of them have trials available and uh, Important there is really benchmark the new solution against previous forecasting process. Uh, how does it compare to the standard approaches? Uh, machine learning maybe also test against open source machine uh, packages, which um, are sort of like state of the art. And this can be a quite you know uh, tricky process actually. And uh, again, a small ad alert here is that you know, SEMA or any forecaster of choice can basically help you uh, in, in this process just to get the uh, and like a neutral view on what uh, forecasting algorithms should be able to do. And of course, then I think look and feel is very important and it should be it really it should be judged by the end users. So it doesn't make sense to have someone. OK, that looks nice, but it never really adjust the forecast. So it really needs to be done by the person that will do that day to day. And of course, the documentation and so on, it's really maybe make a test call. Are they really support? Uh, are they fast in replying to, to support? Or is it like already at the trial phase taking ages to get a response? So I think these are very, um, some of the points that we would sort of see that are helpful for the forecast decision. In that sense, I'm hopefully didn't overrun too much. Thank you very much for attention and I'm um, looking forward for the panel and questions. Thank you, Oliver. I will ask uh, all the panel members to unmute themselves and switch on their cameras and uh, Carlos, our moderator and producer, will switch the attention from one presenter to another. So, we have two questions from John Doe so far. The first one is, uh, I'll read it out loud. It seems that the growth and popularity of such programming languages as R and Python is uh, slowing down. Does it mean that they will become, uh, that they will disappear at some point? And what language will be popular then? Maybe we can start with Oliver. What do you think? Hmm. Well, every software language has sort of like a shelf life, I think. I mean, we still have some dinosaurs uh, around, so probably at some point the same would happen to Python and R. But for the moment, I still believe this is, um, they are pretty much still, uh, I think, very vital to the community, especially I think from an academic perspective, uh, you know, this software are really like sandboxing. Uh, so. I don't see very soon that on that side it will stop. It's just also that a lot have been already published. I mean, packages been uh, growing exponentially. Uh, I think there is even following Lou uh, um, Moore's law. Mm. Um, how long we can keep that up? I'm not sure, but. Uh, <laughs> OK, yeah, thanks. Uh, Robert might might have some answer to this. <laughs> It's rare that I don't have anything much to say, but I really don't know. Um, as you've already pointed out, Oliver, there is um, two rather separate issues, one of which is testing out uh, and developing new ideas where R and uh, Python have been uh, effectively used. 
and the other is the incorporation into uh, mainstream suppliers of software. And um, I think the, the, the barriers to using uh, new languages, and I, 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 you know, I pass on what those might be, uh, are relatively low. Whilst the barriers to moving them into established software such as uh, uh, SAP and, uh, and SAS are very high. So that's a good uh, opportunity for me to pass the buck to Michaela for your views on this. Yes, Michaela, please. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think uh, Oliver is, uh, was exactly spot on with this uh, reply. I think in, in the long term, um, it's uh, the language is uh, somewhat irrelevant. Languages come and go. Uh, they will, we, we've seen uh, over the years, uh, um, some languages coming up uh, like Python more recently for data sciences. Um, there are other languages. Uh, um, from the point of view of um, organizations, the language itself is um, somewhat irrelevant. What they care about is the results. And um, Oliver also pointed out uh, in his uh, overview of the survey that um, the forecasting software themselves are becoming more agnostic to the type of language that is being used. The focus is on uh, providing uh, value to the customers as soon as possible. There might be some uh, um, uh, like just uh, Oliver stated, there is some uh, libraries that are available in some uh, languages. Some are available in some other languages. Uh, the focus is to make sure that um, the the customers or the uh, users of the forecasting softwares are <coughs> able to use the tools that they need for the purpose that they need. Thank you. Uh, the next question that we have is about machine learning methods. Uh, the same person asks, uh, says that machine learning methods performed very well in M5 competition, doing much better than the conventional, uh, such as exponential smoothing or RIMA. Does it mean that the future of forecasting is in artificial intelligence and machine learning methods and that ETS or RIMA will become obsolete? Let's start with Oliver again. I wanted to suggest you should answer that. <laughs> um, but my view is that I think it's, it will not. Well, again, it's probably very much a question of the application. Um, I think uh, the M5 competition was also very much um, on on high frequency data, where I think, uh, yeah, I think the machine learning really have an edge. Um, so believe that. Um, there are certain applications where this type of algorithms clearly uh, have an advantage. Um, on the other hand, I see also probably still many companies which, you know, will will not have such rich data available just because of the nature, you know, data, the systems are set up or the pro uh, the, the the product behave. So I, I think here it, it's it's. Um, yeah, I don't see them dying out, but I think it's it's good to have options. You know, it 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 increases our toolbox. Um, so and having more options there is is always nice. Okay, thank you. So Robert, you're next. Yeah, I I, I think that the, the issue is slightly different. I think the uh, particularly the M5 um, has generated. Uh, some views about um, rather, uh, well, I'll call them advanced machine learning methods and the, the factors they're broadly applicable. The, the, a major point is that the, uh, the standard out of the box machine learning methods are not particularly effective. So we're talking about advanced methods here. And we're talking about uninterpretable methods. Um, as well. So you've got a, a major problem in organizations. I think it's still true uh, to say that uh, SAP APO um, is uh, pretty much for many or perhaps even most large companies still a standard forecasting tool. You know, and that is exponential smoothing based 
uh, and is effectively a dead product. You know, there's a lot of inertia in the system. So what actually gets adopted um, in practice is very different from the advanced methods. We've also got, and this is a, a, a plug for a, a subsequent uh, talk that I'll be giving on forecast value added. You know, you have uh, SNOP processes, supply and operation planning processes, uh, lots of judgmental interventions. It's important that people, in some sense, understand the components of the model. I'm uh, spending my time an analyzing the data, some data, a large data source, and uh, forecast value added is actually delivering broadly speaking, some benefits. And how does that work in the context of machine learning methods? Can they, uh, and I've certainly heard this claim, they can uh, supersede uh, the, uh, the standard methods of using something simple like exponential smoothing plus the demand planner's information. But is that acceptable? Is it more accurate? We have no clues as the answer to those questions. So I think, Yes, this is now we now know that there's machine learning potential. What we are much less clear about, and I have no case studies to um, understand this, is under what circumstances the machine learning methods can make, be made to operate in companies and produce benefits. OK, thank you. Uh, Michele, maybe you can also add something to that. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I want to add to some of the points that uh, Robert already already touched. Uh, there are some uh, definite advantages to some of the simple methods. Uh, one of them is computational speed. Exponential smoothing methods are extremely fast. When you need to run uh, a lot of uh, forecasts in a short time, uh, for example, if you think about uh, embedded devices uh, into uh, into um, such as uh, IoT devices that need to pr produce a forecast in a very short period of time. Um, <clears throat> methods such as exponential smoothing are still very valuable. Um, Robert touched already on the interpretability of some of the methods. Um, clearly, traditional time series methods have the advantage of uh, um, decomposing the series in understandable components, such as a seasonal component and trend component that are easier to explain. Um, in case where there are um, also regulations um, that uh, require the companies to provide uh, explanation on uh, the effects of some of the variables, uh, um, traditional statistical methods are still very valuable. There's been a lot of advances in uh, interpretability of machine learning models, but the traditional statistical methods still have a lot of value. Um, Robert already touched on the <coughs> forecasting value added. Um, I also want to point out that uh, it is true that some of the um, winning strategies of the M5 competition had a really significant advantage of the benchmark, uh, the uh, exponential me uh, methods uh, with the DU, ESPU method. Um, <clears throat> but if we look at the overall results, uh, the exponential, the benchmark ESPU actually performed really well, uh, much better than the great majority of uh, the other method that's based on uh, on machine learning, uh, just out of the box machine learning. Like Robert said, there was a lot of uh, tweaking in the winning methods. Um, so they do st still provide a very good baseline and a benchmark uh, for comparing methods. Um, and the final thing I wanted to add is, um, again, the M5 competition showed that uh, the winning methods are really often, uh, uh, in fact, in all the cases, are a combination of methods. Uh, it wasn't just a single method that was uh, winning the competition. So focusing only on machine learning or a traditional uh, statistical methods is probably not the, um, <clears throat> not the way to think about it. It's really uh, the way to think of what are the right tools for the right um, circumstances that we want to use and how we combine them uh, in an optimal way. Mm, thank you. I think that the last point is quite uh, important about the combination of the two. Um, so we have a couple more questions and a comment from uh, one of the participants. Uh, I will not read the comment out loud, but uh, the other participants can read it if they're interested. 
Mm, the question by Andy Rossi. I'm interested in public policy design by looking at forecasting needs on public slash citizen spending. Uh, if you could share any uh, resources or framework related in that area. I'm not sure. Do we have any comments on that? From any of the panel members? Because I'm not sure what to respond to this. If anyone has some comments, please uh, add them in the chat, in the Q&A, and we will publish them. We have another question. Do you have any recommendation on the software? Uh, this should be interesting. I, I wonder what Michele will recommend. First, it has a user-friendly UI. Second, it should be easy to visualize results. Third, if applicable, easy to adjust the result. And the last can be automated to produce forecasts for thousands of time series. Does any of the members want to respond to that? Well, you probably know my answer, so I'm uh, <laughs> recusing myself from this. <laughs> OK. Um, I just want to point out uh, um, one of the uh, one of the trends also that uh, I, I, I see, at least on our side, is um, uh, moving towards uh, programming free programming environment or code free programming environment that uh, enables users that are not as sophisticated uh, with uh, programming code to still develop uh, pipelines for forecasting or uh, machine learning in other cases um, and uh, have a user friendly um, user friendly interfaces that enable um, uh, data scientists or forecasters to do complex uh, modeling without necessarily uh, the need of um, of programming environment or programming their own programming environment. Um, if you haven't seen the Scratch um, uh, interface produced by MIT for kids, um, that gives a kind of an idea of what I'm talking about, where you just uh, move blocks of code into an interface to create sophisticated programming environment without really necessary knowing the language. Um, that kind of ties up to the first question also, um, if if a language is really relevant or not. Mm -hmm. That sounds what I need, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Try, trying to do some SAS programming, not one of my major skills, I have to say. Uh, I, I do have a comment, which is uh, in a sense a uh, somewhat um, different angle on the same question, really to emphasize and perhaps all, all the participants in this meeting know this, that uh, software uh, diffusion is crucial to the establishment of uh, good methods. Uh, as one of the commentators have said here, uh, the M5 competition uh, is very specific on retail data. The M4 competition, I think, is much more subject to the criticism that uh, the data set had been dragged off the street pretty well, or some bits of it, uh, which were just not appropriate. So at least we've got a view of uh, M5 data. Um, some are short and intermittent, some are, uh, some are promotional driven and so on. So decomposing that and the uh, Oliver mentioned the importance of benchmarking, but it's also important for organizations to uh, benchmark their uh, their methods on their data. There is no, uh, we're, we get often asked the question, well, are there surveys? Well, uh, uh, IBF, the Institute of Business Forecasters, does, does surveys regularly, but they don't answer the core question. What we've now got through the, the various competitions is in a sense a short list of methods, but how they apply in your circumstances. Um, so, the uh, the development of um, standardized benchmarked forecast commercial I suppose it could be free but it's more likely to be commercial software is crucial we do know and that a, a small number of software companies engage with the forecasting community obviously uh, SAS is one of them, Forecast Pro is another, but there are a number of them who, who 
uh, are actively involved in trying to understand we academic the academic ideas and evaluate them in the context of their company. This is actually relatively rare. So I would add a comment to Oliver's slides, you know, how engaged, how resource uh, research oriented are the software companies as well. So I would look for a software, a software that it is actively engaged in pursuing uh, research is relatively open. Some companies won't tell you their algorithms, for example, about those algorithms and uh, permit the benchmarking. Yeah. So no best buys, but at least some uh, some criteria for uh, it, uh, crossing many software companies off the list, I would say. Thank you, Robert. Uh, I think we have time for the last final question and then we need to wrap up. We're a bit uh, going behind. So mm -hmm. Michael Casey says that uh, he finds that major causes of forecast inaccuracy is more coming from data and the quality of uh, data inputs. For example, hierarchical structures are not well defined, promotional events are not well planned or too late, uh, buyers do not take time and so on. Uh, have you seen any software developments in this area that help streamline these issues? I think it would be interesting to see comment of uh, Michele first, or maybe on the SaaS implementations. Yeah, well, I, I can speak for some of the research we have done on our group. Um, um, one of uh, uh, the developers in my team uh, a couple of years ago at ISF uh, in uh, Colorado actually presented a paper on um, how to um, dynamically define a hierarchy. So we have uh, some tools also for uh, looking at hierarchies uh, uh, under different perspectives. So essentially spinning the hierarchies around until you find um, the one that satisfies you. Um, the work that UA presented uh, a couple of years ago in Boulder was about uh, using machine learning actually to define what an optimal structure for the hierarchy could be. Um, these were all research projects we haven't uh, implemented uh, yet in the in in the product out of the box um, there are quite a lot of papers also on uh, how to optimally define hierarchies um, in uh, in an automatic way um, at times using clustering at times using uh, other methodologies we, we've done also some poc about using uh, um, dynamic time warping for uh, clustering series uh, without generating hierarchies. Um, so there is research. I am not aware of anything uh, more specific in the software. There is another the flip side of that. There are methods that uh, are now developed and some of the machine learning methods uh, such as DPR, for example. Um, they consider the series as a whole, not uh, it's not univariate, but it's uh, more of a panel type of estimation. Um, and in that way, the structure of the hierarchy becomes a little less relevant because uh, the methods themselves uh, should be able to pick up some of the interactions um, among the series uh, across the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh Either Oliver or Robert, do we have anything to add to this based on our survey? I don't think we've asked this explicitly. Uh, Robert, you're muted. Robert, we cannot hear you, you're muted. I don't know, I mute that. Uh, the issue of data accuracy has been brought to the, the fore in COVID, so undoubtedly we've had uh, 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 too vigorous a demonstration of its importance. But anyway, uh, as to the question, no, I don't have any views. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think it goes down more to, I mean, uh, probably important on the how the process of forecasting is implemented at, at the company. You know, I think that's always sometimes we, we've seen when we talk to companies that um, it's the software is all fine. It's it's the as the commenter pointed out the data that is not there. But I think to sort of solve that without, um, I think it's very hard to ask an algorithm to do that. Uh, if if it would be much more efficient to try, you know, I think communication within companies is still a major issue. That promotional um, 
uh, uh, activities are happening without telling demand planners. Um, these are things I think that has to be addressed on a on a different level. In, in yeah, yeah, we we have I noticed uh, Ivan a, a question about the uh, diffusion of innovations, uh, which is relevant to a number of the the themes we've explored, and it does seem. Um, the diffusion is very slow, basically. I mean, you can take examples like ARIMA or state space models and so on and say, how quickly do they get embedded in uh, packages? Even uh, SAS, which is a, a major innovator, um, it takes a long time. If the innovation is in SAS for it to get into a SAS product, SAP, I know likewise. So it's a very slow process. Okay, I think we need to close the session um, of this forum. Uh, thanks everyone for participating. Thank you panel members for answering questions. Thank you attendance, attendees for asking questions. Uh, just as a reminder, please follow us on our social media, LinkedIn and Twitter. We will send a follow-up email from this with the link uh, to the video. And uh, we will have next event in two weeks. So hope to see you all then in two weeks. Have a nice day. Bye bye. Thanks, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thanks. Bye bye.